But with that, let's uh, jump into, we turn off this front bank, so one furthest to the right. Let's jump back into uh, our story of philosophy here. Uh, last thing we talked about was Alexander the Great setting up his empire, and when he died, who should his empire go to? Generals. Well, he said the strong, right? Who should it go to? The strong, very Macedonian sentiment. The strongest should be the one who rules. And so his generals naturally uh, start breaking off chunks for themselves. So a bunch of generals break it up amongst themselves. There's a lot of infighting amongst them, trying to expand their individual territories. There's nothing uh, peaceful about it. There's a whole series of wars that are the wars that these guys fight with each other. But when the dust settles, the important part that we care about is Ptolemy and his descendants end up with Egypt down here. And so what Ptolemy starts here in Alexandria, he starts to make Alexandria the next intellectual capital of the world. And remember that Ptolemy is the student of Aristotle, just like Alexander the Great was. And so it's here in Alexandria that we're going to start having uh, a lot of our intellectuals from. And so Euclid now, who we jump to, is going to be Euclid of Alexandria. He was taught, he did do some studying up in Athens, most likely, at the academy. But we refer to him as Euclid of Alexandria, and that's where he was prominent. That's where he did his work. So jumping into, unless we have any background, uh, going to be jumping into Euclid now. The academy is still going. The academy is still going. Uh, since we're not going to be covering <laughs> Hellenistic philosophy, we're not going to see what's going on there. But skeptics end up taking over at the academy, which you can see the irony in that. It was Plato set it up to vindicate Socrates in his search for the absolute and objective good truth and beauty, and the school ends up descending into skepticism. <coughs> and so the sophists went out at the academy. Really? Yeah. I, just to understand some of this territory, first of all, there's a red territory in this Macedonia. Is that just uh, one particular guy who owned, got that? Uh, yeah, we're not going to worry about <laughs> how that's split up, but yes, it's different territories split up amongst different peoples. Uh, I'm not sure that this is marking an actual general who got some of that land. It's just showing you the different political powers. For example, no general owns Rome, but that's outlined here in blue. But I'm seeing some yellow or green uh, down there at the bottom of Italy. That's a different green than that. Oh, okay. But they were Greek. So these were Greek... Uh, Colonies, they're Greek in the same way like the Ionian colonies over here were Greek, and very closely tied. Was Sparta still around? Uh, Sparta is still around, but Sparta has become uh, somewhat irrelevant. I mean, they're still relevant in their little area here, but relative to Greece now, Sparta's nobody. They are not nearly what they were prior to the Peloponnesian Wars. Their population has been completely decimated. They lost control over their helots and the helots' land. They are just almost nobody now compared to the rest of what's going on in the world. Why is uh, there such a huge yellow? Like, is that just all the the because the guy who ends up setting up the Seleucid Empire, that's what he conquers, and that's what he gets. So this is just kind of the fallout of how the wars went. It's not like the generals got together and said, okay, I'll take this, and you take this, and did it all nice and friendly. Okay. So Ptolemy down in Egypt. And so... A lot of Ptolemies from Egypt from here on out. All getting from his name. Okay, so now we jump to Euclid of Alexandria. His dates are roughly 350 to 250 BC. Uh, we know shockingly little about his life. And so we have no clue what these dates are. These are just, he must have been somewhere around here or must have been somewhere around here. He could have lived 60 years, he could have lived 100 years. So these are very rough approximations. We know very little about him. <clears throat> now, why is Euclid so famous? You've likely heard why Euclid's famous. His elements. His elements. His book, The Elements. The Elements is the second most published book in that came out of Western culture. The only book that's been published more? The Bible. The Bible. <laughs> There's good historical evidence that it was a second book printed after the Bible at Gutenberg's printing press. Euclid's Elements. I cannot overstress how crucial this book is to Western society. And when it comes to actual academia, I mean, your three most influential books of all time, I think, would be Aristotle's Organon, Euclid's Elements, and Newton's Principia. Yeah. 
So this is, and if you made me pick which of those is the most important, it would be Euclid's elements. So for what he did, shockingly little is known about him for how important what he did is. It's huge. And Euclid's elements, it is the standard textbook used pretty much from the time he creates it up until late 1800s. In other words, Archimedes and Abraham Lincoln both studied Euclid's elements. That's the only thing I knew. I, I my understanding he stopped campaigning and just went and studied <laughs> Euclid's elements for a real long time. And then came back. Oh, you're talking about Abraham Lincoln? Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just, okay. I, I relate to that. I've read about that well. Then. Right. It was, and there's nothing surprising about that. That is the book, You Were Not an Educated Person, if you had not gone through Euclid's Elements. This was the standard textbook for learning your mathematics. And furthermore, Euclid's Elements becomes the standard by which we set up systematic bodies of knowledge. When people go off in their separate fields and try setting it up as a systematic body of knowledge, everyone is looking to Euclid's Elements as the example. We need to do in this field what Euclid did with geometry. So, standard textbook for learning mathematics from 300 BC to the late 1800s. Uh, can't remember who I got this quote from. Not until the 20th century, by which time its content was universally taught through other school textbooks, did it cease to be considered something all educated people had read, or at least gone through the first uh, five books or so of it. It gets to solid geometry, which people don't really use as much, but the early stuff everyone would have gone to if you were an educated person. No question about it. And so how does he set up his systems? Those of you familiar with axiomatic systems, you're going to see that he's getting close to what we now do with our axiomatic systems. So he starts out each of his books with definitions. A lot of his definitions technically don't work, are technically invalid, but they give you a good intuition for what he was thinking. For those of you more comfortable with axiomatic systems, you know that you have to start with undefined terms initially, and use those to construct your definitions. Mm -hmm. That breakthrough in thought is something that we come to in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And so Euclid, for sure, didn't think that way. Think starting with undefined terms and then defining from there. Understand Euclid is going to have the same problem with his thinking that Aristotle had with his organon. And it took way later thinkers like Gauss and Ramon to finally start working out this tweak in their thinking. Mm -hmm. What was Aristotle's big problem? He thought that there was a one-to-one -one correspondence about propositions and uh, assertions of this universe. How do you know if a proposition is true? You check it in the universe to see if it's true. If a proposition is true, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between true propositions and facts of this universe. And so there's that conflating logic and this universe kind of together in one. At Euclid's time, Euclid's still doing the same thing. They think that they don't think about geometry as a useful abstraction that helps you describe the way our physical universe operates. They think about it as to actually part of the physical universe. It's almost like they're thinking about uh, geometry the same way as physics. Remember Aristotle, he had metaphysics, under metaphysics, he had math, geometry, and then under that physics. That's where he thought it naturally went because it's talking about things here that actually exist rather than think about as abstractions. So Euclid is still very much thinking about that. So he starts his book with definitions, and then he's going to have his postulates, same as the postulates we have in our geometry course. We think about those the exact same way. Then he has what he calls his common notions, or sometimes called axioms. These are not axioms in the way that we use the word axioms. Common notions are things that are more foundational than geometry, and they're common to all fields. These would be things that you come to by going through Aristotle's organon. A modern word for what he's getting at here is these are theorems of logic that he's going to use. So logic, more foundational than geometry. You can use logic to construct your geometry. Your theorems of logic are perfectly valid in your geometry. Uh, one of the theorems of logic that we proved in this class is just a simple one, that equals added to equals are equal. We already did in this class that if I know that A is equal to B, that gives me that A plus C is equal to B plus C. I think we did that in this class. Did we do it in this class? Possibly. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Using. So how do I know this? We use our first law of identity, which is everything is identical with itself. Mm 
So I know that A plus C is equal to A plus C. I know that simply because those are identical symbols on either side of the equal sign. Yes. And then, since A is equal to B, I use my second law of identity, which is I can substitute, and so A plus C is equal to B plus C. The way Euclid says that is equals add to equals or equals. Yeah. It's a theorem of logic that's going to be one of his common notions. Mm -hmm. So they are often referred to as axioms. Uh, it's a bad word for him. It'd be better to call them theorems of logic. And then finally, uh, Euclid's propositions or theorems. The reason that they call it a proposition is because it's going to be something he demonstrates is true. True proposition given your postulates, that's what we mean by theorems. It's just a matter of verbiage in the book that they call it Euclid's proposition one, proposition two. Using modern language, that would be theorem one, theorem two, theorem three, etc. So that's how he's going to have it set up. Uh, before we jump into this proper, uh, give you some of the few anecdotes we have for Euclid to give you just a taste of the man. So one of the anecdotes that we have for Euclid is he was teaching some king's son how to do geometry, or at least the son of a nobleman, how to do geometry. And the youth got frustrated while he was doing geometry, and he says, how am I ever going to profit from this in my life? How is this ever going to lead to something profitable? <laughs> And so Euclid pulled out some coins, gave him the coins, and says, there, you profited. Can we get back to what's important? <laughs> so give you a sense for it. Okay, so now let's jump into Euclid's elements. So he starts out by listing out just a bunch of definitions that he's going to use, and then we'll prove some propositions to give you a feel for how these things go. Because understand, every body of knowledge from here on out is going to be organized this way to the extent that they can. And they're going to try following similar patterns. Spinoza's philosophy, he tries to do this exact same thing. Newton's Principia, he tries to do this exact same thing. So this is going to be the standard that people start using. So definition one, what's a point? A point is that which has no part. Again, an invalid definition for those of you who have geometry, but you see how it gives you intuition for what he's after. Next definition, a line is a breadthless length. Take a length. Give it no breadth, no thickness to it, and you got a line. Now, he does not think about lines as being infinite, and he does not think about lines as being straight. So, he would have called this right here a line. He uses the words slightly different than we do as well. The ends of a line are points. So, the end of the line, what's the end here? That's a point. And what's the end here? A point. <laughs> Definition four. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. Okay, that sounds weird. This has to do with how they actually uh, construct straight lines when they're trying to construct a straight line. And he's making reference to the common procedure there. But a straight line is exactly what you have intuition for, a line that is straight. Uh, a surface is that which has length and breadth only. Now here, a surface does not necessarily have to be flat. So for him, here's a surface. So Imagine it had no thickness. Mm -hmm. But it can be warped. It's not infinite. It's not a plane. Here's a surface. It's not a plane. So there's an example of a surface. A surface is that which has length and breadth only. Definition. The edges of a surface, then. Here's my surface. What are its edges? They're lines. So the edges of a surface, those are lines. A plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with a straight line on itself. Or in other words, it's a nice flat surface. That's what you mean by a plane surface. So if I lay this out flat, now it's a plane surface. Still not infinite the same way we think about a plane as being infinite. Uh, so a triangle is a type of plane surface for him. Next definition. A plane angle... A plane angle, we won't bother with that one. You already have the idea for it. It's an angle that lies in a plane. And he's trying to explain that to you. Definition 9, and when the line containing the angles are straight, the angle is called rectilinear. Oh, sorry. So for him, this is a rectilinear angle. Here's a plane angle. Oh, gotcha. And we're only interested in rectilinear angles. <laughs> <laughs> angles where the sides are straight. Okay. Uh, definition 10. When a straight line standing on a straight line makes the adjacent angles equal to one another, each of the equal angles is right. So if I take a line, a straight line, and a straight line, 
and I make so that this angle is equal to this angle, then these two angles, we call them right angles. Uh, definition 11, an obtuse angle is an angle greater than a right angle, and an acute angle is an angle less than a right angle. Probably could have acute next. Yeah, an acute angle is an angle less than a right angle. And again, he doesn't have these very well defined, so you just have to rely on your intuition. Uh, is that angle bigger or smaller? Yeah. And he very much relies on the pictures to tell him here. It's not like what I tell you guys in geometry, where I say, ignore your pictures, pictures lie. Euclid is very much relying on the pictures to extract information. Because remember, there is no difference between geometry and the actual figures we're talking about in this universe. Mm -hmm. One and the same for him. A boundary is that which is the extremity of anything. <laughs> Definition 14, a figure is that which is contained by any boundary or boundaries. So here's some figure, because it's contained by a boundary. Uh, a circle is a plane figure contained by one line such that all the straight lines falling upon it from one point among those lying within the figure equal one another. <laughs> or a circle for him is a shape you get inside. No matter if you go through the center, what line you put on it, all those lines have the same length. Now, one of the ways that he's slightly different from us, when we talk about a circle, we just mean this actual boundary. And if you want to talk about all the points in between, we call that a disc. He doesn't talk about it that way. So this point is on the circle for him. This point is on the circle for him. Circle boundary would be a circle. Yeah, what he means by circle boundary, we now mean by circle. So he uses language slightly different from how we use it. Uh, and the point is called the center of the circle, the point referenced here, that all the lines fall on, making the same distances. OK. A diameter of the circle is any straight line drawn through the center. And it's terminated by the two boundaries. OK. Definition 18, a semicircle is a figure contained by a diameter and half the circle. So, semicircle is just this part, half the circle. 19, rectilinear figures are those contained by straight lines. So, here is a rectilinear figure. What we would mean now by a polygon. So, there's a rectilinear figure. And he named some of them. If it's three-sided, then we're going to call it a triangle. If it's four-sided, we're going to call it a quadrilateral, etc. Uh, next, definition 20. Of trilateral figures having three sides, or of triangles. Mm -hmm. Of trilateral figures, we have an equilateral triangle is the one that has its three sides equal. An isosceles triangle is one that has two of its sides alone equal. And a scaling triangle is one that has three of its sides unequal. So three types of triangles you already know. Furthermore, or further, of the trilateral figures, a right angle triangle is that which has a right angle. An obtuse angle triangle is that which has an obtuse angle. And an acute angle triangle is that which all three of its angles are acute. Taking you through basic terms you already know. This talking about squares, rectangles, rhombuses, trapezoids, four-sided figures you already know. And then... Parallel lines, they're straight lines, which don't intersect each other. Okay, and with that, we are ready now to introduce his five postulates. The five assumptions that we're going to make. So postulate one, two points define a segment. What does that mean? That means if I give you any two points, then you can construct a segment containing those two points. I, um, sorry, I got tripped up. Will you go back to second? The last definition, parallel lines are straight lines in which being the same plane and produce indefinitely both directions. Oh, okay. I, I just need to read the whole thing. Okay. So, first postulate a line segment, or given two points, we can construct a line containing those two points. I call it a line segment. He didn't call it that. He just called it a straight line. I'll start using more modern language. Mm -hmm. Next one any segment can be extended indefinitely. If I start with a line segment, I can make it longer if I want. Mm -hmm. You can extend the line segment as long as far as you want. Now notice that when you're doing geometric constructions, what are the two tools that you're given? Lines and points. No, the two. Have you ever seen someone actually constructing geometric figures? A straight edge. And they've got two. They have a compass a and a straight edge. What can you do with a compass? What is a compass? Make circles. Uh, 
don't have lots of email addresses. Is there a program for something? I don't know. Use the edge of a book for a second. A straight edge is just like a ruler that's not marked, right? Yes. And what does it enable you to do? If I've got two points, what can I do with my straight edge? I can hold it up and I can connect those two points. That's one thing I can do with my straight edge. Every time I physically do that, I am actually using this postulate. What's another thing I can do with my straight edge? I can say I want to make this line longer. So I hold up my straight edge there and I extend it some using my straight edge. That's using this postulate every time I do that. His next postulate here is a point and a line segment to find a circle. What does he mean by that? If I give you a point and a line segment, then this gives you a circle centered at one of those points. And this is what you'd be able to construct if you had a compass. So every time you draw a circle, you're really using postulate three. And every time you connect two points with a line segment or extend a line segment, you're using these two postulates. And so that's why you are allowed to use a straight edge and a compass in doing your Euclidean geometry. It's because behind the scenes, you're really using these postulates every time you use it. So that's why you use those two tools. Why is postulate two a postulate? It's a bunch of paper. Any segment can be extended indefinitely. Why couldn't you prove that by drawing a segment with two points and then adding another point and extending the segment? It feels like it should be. How do I know that I can pick a point that makes it straight? You're going to need something that gives you that information. Okay, uh, postulate four, all right angles are equal to one another. By equal to one another, he means congruent. And then finally, postulate five, here's his messy one in his last postulate. What does postulate five say? First, I'll give you the intuition for what it says. It says, if you have a line and a point not on the line, how many lines can I draw through this point such that it would never intersect this line down here, assuming this line went on forever? There's only one line I can draw through this point so that these two lines never intersect. If I try to draw one slanted just a little bit different, then eventually on one of the sides, it would intersect. Yeah. Now that's logically equivalent to what Euclid's fifth gives you. And this is what most people use rather than what he's about to say here. Here's what he's going to say. He's going to say, take two lines and draw a third line that goes over them. If these two lines are parallel, then the sum of these two angles should be exactly 180 degrees. And the sum of these two angles should be exactly 180 degrees. If I were to redraw the figure, so we have a line like this and a line like this. Now draw another line on them. Is the angle sum of this plus this going to be 180 degrees? Or is it going to be more or less? It's going to be less than 180 degrees. And so these two lines will eventually intersect on that side. Uh, he used degrees? No. He's going to say if it's less than two right angles. Okay. So here's exactly what he says. If a line falling on two other lines, so here's our two other lines, here's the line falling on them, intersecting them. If a line falling on two other lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, less than 180 degrees, less than two right angles, the two lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side, which the angles are less than two right angles. So he says exactly what I said here. He just says two right angles rather than 180 degrees. And that's his last postulate. And it turns out that that's logically equivalent to this. It's not obvious how, but it is. Okay. So those are his only five postulates. That's all the postulates he uses in his geometry. When we develop in high school, we use a lot more than five. Yeah. We're already up to, I don't know, 13 or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Now he has his five common notions. Again, these are not postulates, and they're not really axioms in the way that we use them today. A modern word for what he's after here is these are theorems of logic. So things which are equal to the same thing also equal one another. In other words, if A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C. Yep. That's all I say. Second, if equals are added to equals, then the wholes are equal. Or in other words, if A equals B, then A plus C is equal to B plus C. 
If A or B are equal and I add the same thing to both of them, the result is equal. Next one. If equals are subtracted from equals, then the remainders are equal. Or in other words, if A is equal to B, then A minus C is equal to B minus C. So those ones are theorems of logic. Now, here's where we get a little bit weirder. Things which coincide with one another equal one another. Things that coincide, take up the exact same space, are equal. Uh, space, uh, are we talking about time and space? Yeah, again, remember how we okay. think about yeah. geometry. You're right. And then finally, the whole is greater than the part. So those are his five theorems of logic that he's going to use. And from here on out, he starts out doing his actual proofs. We'll go through a couple of these proofs to give you a feel for how this goes. So proposition one. This would really be theorem one using Marley. There exists an equilateral triangle on a given finite straight line. So how does this work? He's saying if I give you a finite straight line, I'll draw more over here. If I give you a finite straight line, then there exists an equilateral triangle using that line as one of its sides. So we'll construct the proof over here, give you a sense of the proof. Proof given segment AB. When you do two layers like that in geometry, it's understood that that's a segment whose starting point is A and whose ending point is B. Given AB, comma, I won't use, oh no, we can use this notation. Right? You guys remember that? There exists. Yes. There exists triangle A, B, C such that it's equilateral. So we can construct a triangle using that segment that's equilateral. That's what we're going to prove. So number one, let segment A, B be given. So if you want me to do this proof, you gotta start by giving me some segment AB, and now I can construct the triangle from there. Okay, two. So here's our picture over here to help us think about it. So I have a segment there. Now, based off of our postulates, what do we know we can do with the segment? I can pretty much only do two things. I can use it to make a circle, or I can extend it and make it longer. And that's pretty much all I can do with the segment so far. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's all our postulates allow us to do. So, uh, I'm going to say construct circle A. Construct circle A with radius AB, just to be super clear. So that means construct a circle centered at A with radius AB. So I'll move the point B so I can draw this. We'll put A over here. So that means I take my compass now. I don't have a physical compass, but I'm going to draw this circle centered at A. Yep. How do I justify I can do that? You want your postulate three. This was postulate three. Postulate three, justify that action. Every single time, so I'm given my initial information. From there on out, every piece of reasoning I do, I have to be able to justify somehow. So every line has to be justified from here on out. This is the type of thinking you could introduce in a very systematic way. That's awesome. And so now, what's the next thing we're going to do? We're going to construct a circle at B with radius AB. So construct circle B with radius AB. And once again, I justify that with uh, postulate, three. postulate three. So that gives us this other circle. Now, I'm going to pick a point where those two circles intersect. Let C be a point. Notice there's two of them. We're just going to pick a random one. A point where the circles intersect. And here's where a modern mathematician would say he's cheating. Yeah. How does he justify that those two circles intersect somewhere? And here's where he heavily relies on his picture. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that's just obvious. Look. So he skips 
lines of thinking that we would not skip today. Does it have to do with the assumption that there's a point, that there's a bunch of points on the circle or an infinite amount of points in existence? Because normally when he's talking about points, he's always talking about the ends of things. He could also, he's, what if you constructed two circles like that, but they just didn't have an intersection point? Right, that's all he didn't all justify, right, and we'd have to carefully justify. I see. Okay, so now we've got that. So, five, observe that AC, segment AC, or we could say construct, we'll just say construct segments, segments AC and CB, CB or BC, keep the alphabetical order here. And how do I justify that? Postulate one. Anytime I have two points, I can connect them with the segment. Well, I'm allowed to do that, and I'm allowed to do that. So there's my triangle. I need, still need to argue that it's equilateral. Right. Six. Observe that AC is congruent to, he would have said equal to. He meant equal to mean they're the same length. We now use congruent for that. AC is congruent to AB. How do I know that? That is from the definition of the circle, which he gave earlier. Definition of a circle was take a point and then take all the line segments of the same length you can construct from that point and fill it all out, and that would give you a circle. And that length he calls a radius. And C is on the radius. So I'm guaranteed that AC is the same long as AB. Seven. Observe that BC is congruent to AB. How do I justify that? Definition of a circle. And that's the radius. Yeah, same radius. They're both radiuses of the same circle, and so that's the definition of a circle. These lines are both radiuses of the circle centered at B. So I know that this is the same length as this, and I know this is the same length as this. What remains to show is that AC is the same length as BC. How do I know that? Because our identity equals R equals R. That is our first common notion. If A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And so, you can kind of spell that out. Since I know that BC is congruent to AB, since BC is congruent to AB, and AC is congruent to AB, AC is congruent to AB, then I get BC is congruent to AC. BC is congruent to AC. And that was by what's referred to as axiom one, even though it's not an axiom. or common notion one. So finally nine, therefore, triangle ABC is equilateral. And we're done, square box at the end means, and thus it is demonstrated, our proof is finished. And so that's how that would go. And notice that outside of some nitpicking things, like arguing that those two circles actually intersect, Every single line is somehow justified. Right. And that nick picking stuff didn't get improved upon for almost 2,000 years. Was he this rigorous? This is about as rigorous as he was. That, yeah, I'm sure he was. That's awesome. Okay, so let's do the second one. If I remember right, the second one's kind of messy. So I don't know if I can write out every step here. We'll see, we'll see. My worry is it might be like a 15 line proof. You got a marker board. Yeah. <laughs> got a what? You have a marker board. board. The last word? Move over. Yeah, it's just a projector. We're not using the projector that much. I should have thought about it. The projector glares off of that board, but it helps a lot to have different colors. I should have thought about that and set up over there. Uh, 
we, we don't really need the projector again. I can just look at it and tell you. So, you know what? We'll just do it. I think it's a good idea. And that way we can use uh, different colors. Which will help with the proofs. So I'm just going to turn that off and move over here. Move that. Still get a little bit of glare from the lights, but not as bad. You want the back on? Uh, you could try that, see if that helps with the glare. That covers up that. And just don't let me go past here, and I think we're good. Ooh, that marker's kind of bad. Okay. Sorry, done that. Okay, so the second proof is. Uh, there is a segment equal to a given segment with one end at a given point. Okay, so here's this one. This one is, if I give you some segment here, AB, and I give you some point not on AB, we'll call it point C, then I can construct a segment here the same length as this. And again, think about this very physically. You've got some object that you've constructed a certain distance and you want to go somewhere else and construct something the exact same line. We've got a compass and a straight edge. How on earth are we going to do this? You can well, measure. You can't measure. There's no notion of measuring. Not yet. This is the one that's going to enable us to kind of use a compass as a memory and pick it up and move it wherever we want. So I need to use that to argue now I can come over here and construct a segment CD, where this is as long as that. How do I know I can do that? I need to justify that somehow. Just look at the picture. It's not that hard. Okay, so I'll keep in red our starting information. Is there only red and blue? Here's the way that this proof is going to work. First off, what did the previous, previous proof give me? So maybe we'll write uh, our thinking here as we go. Previous proof gave you that you can construct the So, uh, proof given AB, comma, given AB and C not in AB, so it's a point not on the segment AB, okay. comma, there exists D such that CD is congruent to AB. So I can find some point D such that the segment CD is now the same long as this. That's what I need to argue. So one, let A, B, and C be given. Okay, so we start out there. Now what can we do? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to construct segment AC right there. Once I do that, I want to construct now an equilateral triangle using this segment. How do I know I can do that? Which one? The previous proof. Yeah. It's like I insert all the lines from my previous proof and stick them right there. <laughs> but rather than copy-pasting my proofs, I just reference the proof. And now it's understood, if you don't remember how to do that construction, go back to the previous proof and follow the steps. And that tells you how. Yeah. So we don't have to repeat ourselves over and over again. So from the previous one, I know how to construct some equilateral triangle using that as my segment. We're going to reserve point D for the end of this segment, so I'm going to call this point E. With me? Okay. Now, since this is an equilateral triangle, I know that this length is the same big as this length is the same big as this length. Yep. Right? Yeah. Now, I wonder if I have some markers in here. Yes, I do. All right, uh, green and purple. Unfortunately, I had red and blue. Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come to A and I'm gonna construct a circle using AB. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm only gonna draw a piece of it because we don't care about the whole circle. So I'm only gonna draw the piece that we actually care about. So AB constructing now this circle, we probably care about, that gives us enough that we care about. But that's a circle going around the point A. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I'm going to come to this line segment, or this one, doesn't matter, just pick one of these. 
I'm going to take this segment here from E, we'll do from E, and I'm going to extend it until it hits that circle. So I'm going to come and I'm going to extend this segment until it hits this circle. At what point are we at now? F. You with me? Yes. And now notice that this distance is going to be the same big as this distance. Yep. Right? I'm just on the circle. Yeah. And now finally, uh, using purple this time, I'm going to come to E, and I'm going to construct a circle using this as my radius. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. And so that circle, using that as my radius, is going to come up, and it's going to go a bit more shallow like this, juke up here. You with me? Finally, I get to extend this line segment up here, where it intersects, we call the point D. And then since this is a radius, it's the same big as this. And so this piece is the same big as that piece. Yeah. And so this will be as big as one we started with, as AB. Kind of a mouthful. That, uh, so the, that last part was the second C game. Yeah, you can do that. All right, while you think about that, I'll start now writing it out now that we see what the picture is. So we start out with this. First thing we did is we said to, oops, to construct. I missed your name. Good enough. Okay. Construct a C, that segment. How do we justify that? Postulate one. Any two points give us a line segment. So the first thing I did, remember, uh, red is what I started with. So we constructed that line segment. Next, we constructed this equilateral triangle. So three, let triangle ACE be on equilateral triangle. And how can I justify that action? That was from proposition one, or theorem one. We'll call it prop one, because that's what it's called in Euclid's elements. So I gave us that equilateral triangle. What do we do next? We constructed a circle centered at A. Yeah. That was a green line. So four. Construct circle at A with AB, meaning use that as a radius. Mm -hmm. How am I justified in doing that? Postulate three. So I gave us the green circle. Then I extended EA until it intersected the circle at line F. which I can do with postulate two. So five, extend E A until it intersects circle A at some point and we'll call the point where it intersects F. Mm -hmm. And again, that is now justified with postulate 2. All right, what did we do next? We constructed a circle on EF. We used EF to construct a circle. Mm -hmm. So 6. I don't know why I hate those ends. Construct. <laughs> Circle at what was it centered at? E with what was its radius? Yeah. EF. And that is justified by postulate three. Okay, so that got us that circle. Now I need to extend this line until it hits that new circle at F. Seven, extend. Uh, EC 
ECCE, same thing. Extend EC until it intersects. You typically uh, name a circle by the point it's at the center of. So this purple circle is circle E. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to worry about being too specific since there's only one circle centered at E and only one circle centered at A. So we have circle A and circle E. Oh, yeah. Two circles. You can't, have, you can't have two different circles centered at the same point. Yeah, you can. There's a circle, there's a circle centered at that point. But since we don't have that, then the center uniquely identifies it. Okay. Extend EC until it intersects circle, what circle? Circle E. At point D. So D is where they intersect. How am I justified in doing that? Again, postulate two. The one that says we can extend line segments. And now we've got our picture. Now I just need to argue our uh, side lengths are the same. So eight observe that. What are we going to observe? Are congruent first. First, let's note that AF and AB are congruent. Observe that AB is congruent to AF, and that is by definition of a circle, because they're both radiuses of the same circle, right? And now observe that EF is congruent to ED, definition of a circle. Observe that EF is congruent to ED, again that's by definition of a circle. What was next? I need to argue that CD is the same big as AF. So I know that ED is congruent to EF. Right. I know that EC is congruent to EA. Uh -huh. And therefore, this piece is congruent to that piece. Yeah. Equals subtracted from equals are equals. You have to spell that out in proof. In, yes. So 10. Since, so since I have that ED is congruent to EF and EC is congruent to EA, then their individual part CD is congruent to AF. CD is congruent to AF. How do I know that? Equals subtracted from equals are equal. I think that that was axiom three. One of your common notions using common notion three. So that's how we justify that this is the same length as that. And we know that this is the same length as that, so now we need to say this is the same length as that. Yep. So 11, then CD is congruent to AB, and we know that by common notion one, axiom one, common notion one. We said two things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And that's it. That's what we were after. So I constructed a segment CD congruent to AB. Or equal to. He would have said equal he to. He would have said equal to. We now mean congruent. Okay. He didn't think about equals as uh, strictly as we do now. When we say two things are equal, we mean that they are identical with each other. Right. When they use equals, you have to infer from context what they mean. Sometimes they mean equal length. Sometimes they mean equal area, etc. Okay, that's the last one we'll write out all the way. From here on out, I'll just give you a sense for how it keeps on building. And I'll just give you the picture. We won't bother writing it out. But it gets a lot easier for the next few proofs from here on out. So let's do another one. And then after that, we'll keep doing as many as you guys want until you get bored. Okay, right. so proposition three. It is possible to cut off from the greater of two given unequal segments, a segment equal to the lesser. Okay, okay so I've got two segments here. A, B, and I've got segment C, D. All I know is that these two segments are not equal to each other. He's saying I can find a point on this segment 
such that it gives me a segment congruent to that. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's our start, and then I'll fill in with blue what we're doing. So we start with this picture. These aren't necessarily parallel or anything like that. Using this proof, I know that I can, from C, find a point such that this segment is congruent to this. Yes. That's using this proof. Yeah. Now, I go to C and I construct a circle using this length. Yep. Which gives me this point. And now this is going to be congruent to that. So CF is now congruent to AB, yep. where F is a point on the segment. So that one's much easier. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Make sense? Yep. So there's a picture for that. We'll move on to the next one. If two triangles have two sides equal to two sides respectively and have their angle contained by the equal and have the angle contained by the equal sides equal, then they also have the base equal to the base. The triangle equals the triangle and the remaining angles equal the remaining angles respectively, namely those opposite the equal sides. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying here's your side angle side for two triangles being congruent. So take two triangles. Yeah, and you're going to see it has a very unsatisfying proof using doing it the Euclid way. <laughs> so we've got these two triangles. What do I know about these two triangles? We'll call that A, B, C, and we'll call this D, E, F. We've got these two triangles, and what I know about these two triangles is that this side length is congruent to this side length. Okay. This side length is congruent to this side length. And this angle is congruent to this angle. So you have to talk about angles now. Uh, he defined angles. As well. Yeah, like the weird broken angles and yeah. normal angles. Oh. What exactly his definition is, they're not very satisfying definitions. Yeah. So how does uh, Euclid think about doing this? Well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to come and we're going to take this point B and we're going to stick it over here on E. So this is both going to be the point E and B. Now, since this segment is the same one as this segment, I can line it up so that A lands exactly on D. Yep. Oh, and this is like axis four. Yes. Yeah, and then, since this side length is, this, or since this angle is the same thing as this angle, then this side segment will come and land exactly on this segment. And then since this segment's length is the same as that segment's length, then C will come land exactly on F. And since things which coincide are equal, these two things are equal. <laughs> Very unsatisfying uh, proof. Like and we basically have to introduce side angle side as a postulate in geometry now. Yeah. We'd be good if you just explain it rather than write <laughs> out every single step. <laughs> yeah, that one I will try writing down the steps for. It's very unsatisfying. Oh. It's basically just move it over and see they both land on each other. No, this is not very rigorous. You have to have this as almost this. We have what's called the side angle side postulate, which isn't quite the same thing as the side angle side congruence for triangles, but it's what gives you it. What's so this difference? is almost uh, the postulate. Huh? What's the difference between this and the postulate? Uh, they're, they're basically logically equivalent. We don't need to worry about it. The point is, that's how Euclid does it. Not very satisfying. So some of this proves far more satisfying. This was great. He did a phenomenal job. This one, not near satisfying. Yeah. But what do you mean, uh, satisfying? Uh, you feel like he's kind of cheating, or you feel like, uh, how do you know you can do that? Like, explain without a doubt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you feel like there's missing details. And maybe, you know, you can't think about it right now, but maybe there's a way to do it and break what he's saying. Yes. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, Next one is, in an isosceles triangles, the angles at the base are equal to one another, and then the angles underneath them are equal to one another. So now this one's more satisfying. So now we have side, angle, side. If I have two triangles, and a side, an angle, and a side are all congruent to each other, then the two triangles are congruent to each other. That's what his previous theorem just gave us. Okay, so now his next one is, if I give you some isosceles triangle, isosceles meaning this side length is the same as this side length, then this angle is the same as this angle. That's what we have to argue. So we'll call this triangle, we'll put A at the top, A, B, C, 
I need to argue that this angle is the same thing as this angle. Now, observe, I'll just say note here since we're not doing the full period. Now, angle BAC is congruent to angle CAV. Right? BAC is the same as CAV. So then we get that triangle. Triangle BAC is congruent to triangle CAB. And also we have this triangle is congruent to this triangle by side angle side. They're the same triangle. <laughs> by side angle side. Okay. Kind of. We have, imagine I took this triangle and I flipped it on itself. We're using the fact that this triangle has symmetry. So if I flipped it on itself, then C would end up over here and B would end up over here. Yeah, just because all the points. And so those are the two triangles that we're talking about. It's just because all the points are logically identical, they would need to be the same point. Do you always start with like the first letter is the bottom left of the triangle? No, I just picked it that way. Completely arbitrary. So, so but I kept my order here the exact same. Well, BAC, triangle BAC. So we're looking at BAC is congruent to triangle CAB. So or CAB if we're looking at red. Huh? A lot of overlap with, well, I see what you're saying. So notice that we've got this triangle and then this triangle flipped on itself. And it lands exactly on itself. So this angle, when you flip it, lands exactly on this angle. That's the point, is we're trying to say that those two angles are congruent. So triangle BAC is congruent to triangle CAB by side angle side, which means that angle B is congruent to angle C. Angle A is congruent to angle A, and angle C is congruent to angle B. Okay. So then, that gives us that angle B is congruent to angle C. Angle A is congruent to angle A, and angle C is congruent to angle B. So the order that you list those out there matters. So these are congruent by side angle side because BA is the same as CA, angle A is the same as angle A, and angle AC is the same as angle AB. Or sorry, side AC is the same as side AB. And so then there's a correspondence between all their angles. Okay, want to continue with some more of these? Yes. Another one? Yeah, Well, I'm also going to do a little bit of algebraic ones after this. Let's, let's jump forward to the algebraic ones, and then we can come back and do more of these if you want. Because there is a natural question in all of this, which is, we've already talked about it, which is, the Greeks went crazy with geometry. Why not algebra? And we already talked a little bit about why that was the case. If I give you some square where this has side length one unit, whatever your unit is, what is the length of this side in terms of units? It's the square root, one. It's the square root of two, which it turns out, for, according to the Greeks, is not a number since it's irrational. Oh, yeah. Now, to give you intuition again for why this was so disturbing, if I were to tell you to measure exactly how long this wall is, then what might you do? You might first go start with feet and realize feet don't go into this perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So then you might pick something like inches or something and keep picking smaller and smaller. Eventually you can find something small enough that goes perfectly into measuring this wall. Oh, you think so? Got well, you for sure can. Make your unit half the wall. Okay, it's two of those units. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but now, imagine that you want to measure this wall and that wall with your same units. So you got to find one that perfectly goes into this side and into that side. Right. Now it seems like there should be something small enough that you can do both. There is. There is. Probably. Yeah. What we prove, this square root of 2 being irrational, is logically equivalent to there is no unit out there that both perfectly goes into this side and its diagonal. If I get a unit that perfectly goes into its diagonal, it for sure does not perfectly go into its side length. 
And if it perfectly goes into its side length, it does not perfectly go into its diagonal, no matter how small we make it. That is a very disturbing fact. Yeah. And so since for the Greeks, a number being rational and being a number are one and the same thing. So they said, we can construct this length here, but it's not a number. How long it is isn't a number. And yet geometry can somehow talk about it. So geometry somehow seems more powerful than numbers in terms of what it can and cannot talk about. This is where they killed the Pythagorean who exposed the world, right? Uh, supposedly there were Pythagoreans who killed uh, a member of their cult, cult. <laughs> Based on the for uh, telling people that the square root of 2 was irrational. Because it breaks down their whole theory of everything being constructed fundamentally from numbers. That means there's some fundamental number that goes into that and goes into that. Some fundamental number that goes into this side length and the diagonal. So it breaks down their whole philosophy with everything being reduced to numbers. Yeah, reality doesn't seem to care about our numbers. Reality is going to assert itself, and it couldn't care less what you think. So that's why they go crazy with geometry. So I want to take you through some, uh, these ones are kind of more satisfying, some geometric proofs for algebraic properties that you already know. So you know that a plus b squared is equal to uh, a squared plus. You do the a times the a, a gives you a squared. squared. You do the a times the b, gives you plus ab. You do the b times the a, gives you plus ba or ab. And then you do the b times the b, gives you plus b squared. Or in other words, it's equal to a squared plus ab, or 2ab, 2ab plus b squared. Now, the ancient Greeks knew this. They just would have come close to talking about it like that, thinking about it like that, or writing it that way. So how did the Greeks prove this property? Geometry. Yeah, they proved it all geometrically. So here's what they would say. Start out with the square. And the length of the square, we're going to call this here A, this distance A, and this distance B. Maybe uh, use blue for my labeling now. So there's a point, here's A, here's B, and here's B, here's A, right? Yeah. Put some dotted lines in here. But uh, so far the important thing is, is what is the area of this whole square? Uh, a, B times A, B, B squared. It's a, a, B squared. this distance times itself. So this is representing a plus b squared. That's why we call that square. It's the area. This is giving you the area of something with side length a plus b. Yeah. That's why we call that square. A square. Yeah, I just squared a plus b. I made a square with side length a plus b. Okay. Here it is. Now, what is the area of this square inside of it? What's the area of this piece? B uh, it's b times b. B squared. It's a square with side length B. What's the area of this piece? A length a times a width. AB. It's B times A. AB. Length times width. AB squared plus A squared. Sorry. What's the area of this rectangle right here? A times B. Length times width. And what's the area of this square up here? A squared. A squared. A times A. And so A plus B squared is equal to, we have a square side length A, we have two rectangles with length and width AB, and then we have a square a side length B. And that's how they proved it. Giving you just a picture. Very satisfying. Yeah. Uh, Reminds me of the uh, in calculus trying to learn how to scale using a formula. Just kind of gives me some flashbacks. So. <laughs> uh, let's try another one. What's another common algebraic property that we use? Another common one is you do quadratic formula. A point. Oh, we can't do. Oh, quadratic formula. Uh, no, that's a purely algebraic. Well, you it has a nice do geometric do counterpart. Do it. Does it? Because yes. I've never right. understood that. You can do it. Yeah, but I, oh, there's no way I can give you the GMS. <laughs> but it does have a satisfying one. But let's look at a plus b times a minus b. What does that equal? That is From algebra, you do the a times the a gives you a squared. 
You do that A times a B gives you a plus AB. You do the A times a negative B gives you minus AB. Yeah, and then you do the B times a negative B gives you minus B squared. Oh, right? Yeah. Or in other words, it's equal to A squared, those two cancel out, minus B squared. Yeah. Okay. How would the Greeks have done this? Again, they would have come. Drawn our picture here. Use blue. So this is A, this is B, this is A, and then mark down here. I can do right. This whole side length is A, this right here is going to be B, and so this is going to be A minus B. This whole distance is A, oh. that's B, so this is A minus B. You with me? Yes. Now I'm going to add our dotted lines. This is a ring, rectangle? Yeah, it's a rectangle, not a square. Gotcha. It's a rectangle whose height is AB and whose width is A. a. Now we are looking for the area of the one that's A plus B by A minus B. We're looking for the area of purple. The rectangle with a plus b times a minus b. Okay. You with me? Yep. Okay. So first off, let's get this square. You with me? <laughs> so I'm going to start with this square. So that is going to be a squared. But so far we've overcounted. We grabbed this area which we didn't want. So minus off that AB, and so now, so far we've got this purple right here. Yeah. Now we need to come up and get this purple up here. Yeah. Uh, B is subtracted. Well, um, B plus A. Oh, it's, it's A, A minus. What did I do wrong? You did minus AB instead of plus AB uh, step. You just went a step ahead. No, I've got something obviously wrong. This right here is a squared. Is that correct? That. Subtract off what is this piece? A times B. Leaves me that piece. Oh, okay, yes. Plus, AB gives me all of this. But now I need to get rid of this piece right here. So B minus, squared. what's this area of this square? B squared. B squared. Okay, there we go. Very cool. Uh, look at that. Oh, uh, the, is our mathematical form that we have today, uh, it, it exists during this time? No, no. This, this type of notation, uh, a lot of the advancement made in algebra was done by the Arabs during their golden age. You'll notice algebra is very Ara Arabic sounding. Yeah. Strange. And so they developed a lot of what Euclid did geometrically. They went and redid algebraically. So doing the same things again, but now doing it algebraically. But a bunch of the notation that we have comes even after that. Seems like they gave them a lot more creative freedom to go nuts with it. Uh, it, it took a while to realize how strong the connection is between what we're talking about in algebra and what we're talking about in geometry. And even picturing these things as talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And so that largely starts to happen with the introduction of uh, what we call analytic geometry. Yeah. And talk about something like the equation of a line. If you went back and talked to Euclid about the equation of a line, he'd have no clue what you're talking about. That's where you get your Cartesian plane, right? Yes. Cartesian, named after Rene Descartes. Of course. Of course. Sense. Not that it says Descartes like Cartesian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to do another algebraic one? We could do the third one, a minus b times a minus b. Okay. Why not? So, we already did the Pythagorean theorem in this class, right? Uh, yeah, but we should do it again. 
You want the Pythagorean theorem again? Sure. Okay, so we'll do this one, then we'll do Pythagorean theorem. So this is equal to a times a gives us a squared. We have a times minus b, which is minus ab. We have minus b times a, which is minus ab. And we have negative b times negative b gives us plus b squared. Right? Or in other words, a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, let's see how we can get this geometrically. Uh, so draw out our figure. Okay, so I'm going to draw this square so that we have side lengths A. So this is side length A, this is side length A. I'm going to mark this point over here. I may call this distance B, and so this distance is A minus B. And I'll probably want to do the same thing over here. Sorry, I'm kind of making this up as I go, so I hope it comes out nicely. All right, now let's add all our dotted lines and see what we can figure out. Okay, so I am looking for the area A of the square. I'm looking for A minus B squared. So the area we care about is this area. That is A minus B squared. Yes. You with me? Yes. So we'll start out with A squared, the area of the whole square. Now we've overcounted. Yes. I'm going to subtract off this whole rectangle. What's this whole rectangle? A, B. Now I'm going to subtract off this whole rectangle. Which is going to be minus AB. Right. But notice that I removed this square twice. When I removed this rectangle, I got rid of this square. When I removed this rectangle, I got rid of that square again. But I didn't have that square to get rid of. So I've got to put it back in before I can get rid of it again. So A squared minus AB minus AB plus B squared. There it is. Okay, and you said you want to see a Pythagorean theorem again? Yes. Okay, I won't go through justifying that the angles are right angles. I'll kind of just give you the picture. <laughs> All right. So, going to give you... Uh, got to draw the same square twice here. Supposed to be the same square. Gotcha. All right, mark <laughs> off A, B, pictures lie. A, B, so there's one way that we'll mark it off. And then the other way that I want to mark it off, it's going to be like this. We're going to mark it off. Okay, so this is still going to be A. A's our small one, B's our big one. A, B, A, B, A, B. So what's the area of this whole square? A, B, A, B squared. A plus B squared. Oh, A plus B squared. Right? Yep. And what's the area of this whole square? A plus B squared. So these two things have equal areas. Okay, what is the area of this square? We've already done that. That's this piece here is A squared. This piece is B squared. This is AB. And this is AB. So add up all those areas. This is going to be A squared plus 2AB plus B squared, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the areas of this thing. So I told you that what I'm not going to argue is that these are in fact right angles. So that this inner shape is in fact a square. It's not hard to argue that. All these, no, it's not, just takes a little bit of time. All these triangles are all congruent to each other by side angle side, because that's a right angle side side, right angle side side. Yeah. So this side length is the same big as this side length, is the same big as this side length, is the same big as this side length. Call that side length C. So what's our total area here? First off, of this inner square, we'll do the area of this one in blue so we don't get confused by all the purple. The inner square is C squared. What's the area of one of these triangles? One half A times B. Half the base times the height. So I'm left with C squared plus 
I have half the base times the height four times. So I have four times one half the base times the height. Or we'll do one half AB just right in alphabetical order. Right? Yep. What's four times one half? Uh, two. two. So this is equal to C squared plus two AB. And this is A squared plus two AB plus B squared. Thank you. And now, equals subtracted from equals or equals. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So the area of that square plus the area of that square perfectly equals the area of that square. And that square is subtracted on the hypotenuse of the of a triangle. Of a right. Triangle. So uh, just seeing it from the picture here, notice that b squared, I can come and write, I can construct that square right here. So here's b squared, and I can construct a squared right here. So now this is a squared. And so if you construct a right triangle, make a square on that side, square on that side, square on that side, the area of this square plus the area of that square are perfectly equal to the area of that square. Yep. Another way of saying the Pythagorean theorem. I'll get you. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So there's the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, so I think that gives you a good taste of geometry here. And how it continues. He proves all these theorems just from his five postulates. And so jump fast forward uh, almost 2,000 years to Newton. And Newton is repeating the same process, but now he's going to do the same thing for physics. And except for what are his postulates going to be? We call them Newton's laws of motion. Those are his postulates. And so he starts with his three postulates of motion, if you want to include gravity, his law of gravity. And he's doing exactly what Euclid's doing in his elements. He's saying, let's take those as postulates, and if these are true, what else can we deduce? What else can we discover? Yeah. So that's how it continues out. So Euclid's Elements, phenomenal work, completely changes the way that we start setting up systematic bodies of knowledge. It's amazing what Euclid did. I should probably add one uh, qualifier here. While Euclid put together the elements, um, odds are the vast majority of what's proven in there, he did not himself prove. What he did was he took all the proofs of his day and organized them in the systematic body of knowledge. So that from these five postulates, you're able to deduce everything else. That's what he did that was so amazing is the way he organized it. And he probably had to come up with a couple of proofs himself along the way. That's so but it's largely just organizing it all on basically Aristotle's system now for how systematic bodies of knowledge should be set up. Aristotle says, here's the system, here's how it should go. Hugo says, I'm going to go do that with math now. Here we go. Uh, and Newton's the one that eventually comes along and says, I'm going to do that with physics now. Here we go. So how, how far apart was Aristotle and Euclid in the time range? Uh, Aristotle, since our years on Euclid aren't known very definitively, but it's going to be that uh, Euclid most likely knew people who knew Aristotle. Well, it's not like uh, Euclid's going to say, I'm so inspired by Aristotle. It's that what's going on now in Alexandria is carrying on the Aristotelian way of thinking about the world and organizing the world. Actually, we're going to start collecting facts of this universe, and we're going to start by reasoning on those facts and see what we can deduce from those facts. See, for Euclid, his postulates that he has, those are things that you inductively reason to by looking at our universe. If you were to ask Euclid, how do you know that any time you have two points, you can connect it with a line segment? He wouldn't say, well, that's just a postulate, and we're just going to continue with it. He would have said, uh, give me any two, try it. I was able to do it with that one. Try again. I was able to do it with that one. They're inductively reasoning to these premises because they think geometry is telling them about the universe. Yeah. So still a bit mistaken, but it's that same system of thought. Starting with the basic facts and inductively reasoning on those two premises and then applying logic to it to come to conclusions. That's, that's actually huge. Yeah. It is huge. Yeah. It's amazing. So, like so far, the big products of philosophy. Yeah. Unfortunately, philosophy jumps off the deep end. Yeah, well, that's personal interpretation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. It's the only interpretations I've got. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Do we have a recap of everything we've done so far? No, our recap of Aristotle was already the recap of everything important we've done so far. Okay. And now you could. Oh, yeah, so... Back to we'll now switch to logic. Uh, what I was planning on doing after Euclid, uh, I was torn. I was either going to start with the Hellenistic philosophers. Or Nietzsche. 
No. <laughs> or uh, do uh, the crash course on Rome up to the point we're talking about. Yes. Uh, uh, and I thought that that would have been a lot of history back to back, so I was debating there, maybe put Rome off for a second. That would be awesome. That yeah, it would have been good. awesome. It would have been a ton of fun. Good, but it would have been a lot of work. For you. Uh, for me. For you. You can do the review, and I'll show up. <laughs> Are you using the same logic textbook you always use for this? Yes, course? I'll be using that same logic textbook that I always use for the logic course. I think this is the end of this course, so we can turn this off. Uh, who owns 